All right, let's get started. Thank you for turning up on time. We'll see if anybody else arrives a little bit later. Um, my name is Nick Howe. I work for a company called Area 9. Our stand is right there. So if you're interested in anything afterwards, you've got 20 feet to go. Um, all righty. Um, Award-winning certification. So this is something that we submitted to Learning Technologies and won an award for. I'm going to talk about medical education, but this has general applicability. So it doesn't matter what subject you're interested in, whether it's behavioral skills or whether it's sales training or regardless of what it is, this is generally applicable, but we are going to focus on medicine. So for the past 10 years or so, we've had a partnership with the New England Journal of Medicine, Nijam Group. They're very much like the British Medical Journal. They're one of the most respected medical journals in the world. So they produce medical content with the goal of training doctors and preparing them to take their board exams. The board exams are the most difficult exams that any doctor in the US can take. It's when you become a very senior practitioner and you want to get certified, then the New England Journal will help you achieve that. Um, but one of the questions is, how do you best build conscious competence? Theoretically, the job that we're all in, we want, to, we want people to behave on the job. We're trying to drive new behaviors. And the question is, what is the best way to do that? Now, we often think about training on a simple access. Access from incompetent to competent. We want to build people's skill. We want to make them more knowledgeable. We want to make them more skillful. And people don't know things. We have to teach them things. It's pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, the science says it isn't like that. So what the science says is there's another dimension to this, and it's the conscious and unconscious dimension. And so typically, when we're doing training, we focus in that bottom right-hand corner. So that's where people know they don't know something, and we just have to teach them. And that seems completely reasonable, except when we've worked with tens of thousands of doctors, only 6% of the total domain of what we're trying to teach them falls into that square. So just think about that. Everything that you're developing today, all the programs that you're putting in place today, and you're trying to teach learners, the bit that they are consciously incompetent, they know they don't know it, can be single-digit percentages. And this thing is going automatically. The thing that we don't think about is that bottom left-hand corner, the unconsciously incompetent. So this is where someone doesn't know that they don't know something. They think they know it. And amongst the doctors that we train with the New England Journal, something like 20% of everything they think they know, in fact, they don't. So think about that the next time you go and see the doctor. One in five things that they think they know, they don't. And that's why second opinions are super important. So the goal of training is actually to build conscious competence and to address those other areas. Now, one thing that I should also say is, if you add those two numbers on the bottom, 18 and 6, you get 24. So that means three quarters of the things, at least for those doctors, sit above the line. So that's where doctors already know the things that we're trying to teach them. So if we persist in doing normal training approaches, we're just wasting their time because we're trying to teach them things they already know. Now, that applies in every discipline. 
We have done this with salespeople, with technical training, with IT training, with soft skills training, with leadership training. And the number in the bottom right hand corner ranges from 15 to 40% for every subject. So the folks that you are training or the folks that you have working for you, up to 40% of the time, they think they already know this or they think they can do it. And so the question is, can you develop a training system, a training approach that doesn't waste time teaching things they already know and can overcome that unconscious incompetence? Now, a tutor will do that. If you have a one-on-one -on -one training experience, part of the job of the tutor is to try and figure out what do you know and what don't you know? And what do you think you know? And then to work with you to overcome that. Whereas in a classroom, often I'm presenting information to you. And the trouble is, once you've got a group of people, it's almost impossible to do that individualized teaching. Now this is an example of something that is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. If you, I think, Carol, I think I'm picking up something from next door. Um, if you assess people on how well they perform on a subject and then split them up into quartiles, you'll get a range of performance. Some people will do really well, some people will do not so well. If you then ask them, how well do you think you did, you get a very different picture. People, humans, all of us, how are very bad at identifying how well we know things and how well we can do things. If you've ever given anybody a performance review, you will know that the people who are most surprised are the ones who perform most badly because they always think they did way better. And that's just human nature. And so this is one example of the learning science that we've managed to encapsulate into software to create that personalized learning experience to overcome a lot of these challenges. And I find it completely amazing. Charles Fidel is one of our advisors. We've got personalization in shopping. We've got personalization in entertainment. Of all the things that are uniquely individual, we have almost no personalization in teaching. And that's just crazy. For decades, we've been taking a one-size-fits-none approach. We've been creating courses based on the average group of people that we're trying to train. So what we've done working with the New England Journal and what we do for many other clients is to create a system which creates that personalized experience at scale that it embodies all those elements of learning science, but also can adapt to meet the needs of every single individual. And it doesn't matter whether it's on a desktop or whether it's on a mobile device, it's the ability to adjust in real time to meet the needs of each and every person who's trying to become proficient in something. Whoops. Now we've had 14 million interactions with doctors through this program. And we've trained over 15 million learners using this approach. So this isn't some startup, it's not something recent. This is rock solid research-based, evidence-based practice that's been around for years. But bizarrely, it has hardly penetrated corporate education. The evidence is clear. This is a peer-reviewed scientific study that we did with those doctors that shows that using this approach for exam preparation, 
generates statistically significant better performance by doctors. And we've seen that time and time again. We've seen it at universities with students. We've seen it with salespeople. We've seen it with leadership skills. Now, great, it's a statistic on a slide, who cares? I'll give you one example of a quote from a real doctor who went through this program. This is someone who'd been out of medical practice for two years and was using this approach to refresh their knowledge. Because one of the things that we often don't think about when we train is that knowledge and skill is constantly evolving. So it's as much about helping people refresh and remember the things that they've already been taught as it is about teaching them something brand new. And in this case, as a direct result of this personalized training approach, she was able to identify and treat an HIV patient that she doesn't believe she would have been able to get another way. And that comparison is against other existing training methods. So this isn't a training against no training. This is a personalized approach compared with just a general training approach. So what we do at Area 9 is give you the ability to create personalized adaptive training. So using exactly the same content that you use in your existing training programs, but underpinned by a software algorithm that adjusts to meet the needs of each and every individual. And so through a platform that we call Rapsode, you can both create and deliver these personalized learning experiences. Now this is completely transparent with existing learning management systems. So if you've got an existing LMS, doesn't matter whether it's Cornerstone or Saba or Totara, whatever it is, you can get all the benefits of personalization simply by creating an adaptive SCORM object. So you don't have to change your existing infrastructure. It's kind of like giving your LMS a steroid boost. So the way it works is it's going to adapt in real time. As the learner interacts with the content, the algorithms are going to adjust to meet the needs of the individual. <coughs> and there's almost nothing you need to do as a developer to make that happen. The software is taking care of all of that for you. And so the benefits that you get from this are threefold. First of all, you get much higher proficiency. So I won't ask the question, do you know if your learners are actually learning anything? Because most training today is fire and forget. I roll out a course and people complete it. I've got no idea whether they needed it. I've got no idea whether they learned anything. I've got no idea whether I wasted their time showing them stuff that they already knew. So the interactive nature of this personalization gives you a huge amount of data that not only raises proficiency of everybody, it gives you evidence of proficiency. Secondly, it reduces time. Because most people know something about the thing you're trying to teach them, if we can avoid reteaching that, we can save time. And typically, this teaches twice as fast as e-learning or as instructor-led training. Now, I'm not saying this is a complete replacement for instructor-led training. There are absolutely scenarios where group interaction is the best thing you can do. But if you are doing knowledge or skill building, then by personalizing, you can teach twice as fast for most people. So that's thousands or hundreds of thousands of hours of productivity that you can give back to your workers for them to get on and do their jobs or to give them an opportunity to learn other things if you're trying to build proficiency quickly. The last thing is engagement. I see a lot of people building courses in Captivate and Storyline and Rise and all these new tools and adding in interactivity 
to make it more engaging. Because adaptive learning is inherently interactive, the learner is engaging with the content and the system is checking their proficiency, it's inherently an engaging way of learning. So you don't have to waste time adding extra things into the course. It's like putting lipstick on a pig. It's a bad experience. Let's try and make it prettier. Don't do that. Let the learning experience itself be engaging and focus on creating the best possible content and getting the best possible learning experience. So you can kill three birds with one stone simply by switching your existing content into this adaptive learning approach. That's all I got to say for the moment. I could speak for about three hours on this subject in terms of the learning science that underpins it, the, the other benefits that you get from it, some of the different use cases. We've seen this in airline training with pilots. We've seen it in medical training with doctors and nurses. We've seen it in IT training. So by making some relatively simple changes to the way that you develop content and letting the software work its magic, you can create dramatically better outcomes for your learners, which I think is where we should all start. So if you'd like to learn some more information, our stand is literally 20 feet that way, Area 9 Lyceum, stand J40. Um, are there any questions? None at all. Come on, you must, someone must have a question. I'll even take off the mic so it, people don't have to hear your question or your answer. All right, thank you all for your attention, everyone. We hope to see you on the stand in a little bit.